You're listening to 12:40 a.m. WGBB. It's Monday night, November 24th, the Monday just before Thanksgiving. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Salzorn in New York, 6:30 p.m. Eastern Time. And normally Dave's going by stores right about now. Dave's in the studio, but he's preparing for a show. But the show's going to start in just a, uh, in just a few moments. Dave gave me permission to do this because we've got a major exclusive here. It's a story everybody's been talking about. Michael Jackson was arrested last week on charges that he molested a 12 or 13 year old boy at his ranch in California. We talked about this a few minutes ago. Jackson, of course, denies the charges, and he was released on three million dollars bail, and is putting together a team of lawyers to defend himself. Ten years ago, the same thing happened, and rather than go to trial, Jackson settled out of court. It saved him an ugly media circus, but also made a lot of people wonder if he was guilty and weaseling out of it because he's so rich. We've been talking about the Jackson story on my show, Your World, can be heard on this station, Sundays at 6 and about 130 other times. And I'm sure Dave will be covering it on Dave's Gone By a little later on in his 90 minutes uh, of radio. But right now we do have a guest in the studio. I almost can't believe it, but he's really here. His lawyers have asked him, by the way, to avoid the media, but he says he's familiar with this radio station and with my show, which scares me a little bit. He feels this is an appropriate venue to plead his case and get a fair hearing from listeners. Now, we only have him for a few minutes, but we're obviously very grateful that he's here. We're not making judgments, we're just asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome in the studio at WGBB, the man so many called the king of pop, Michael Jackson. Uh, Mr. Jackson, it's good to have you with us. Thank you, Joe. I am so glad to be here. Now, this has been a very difficult week for you. How are you holding up? Well, Joe, this has been one of the worst weeks of my entire life. The only thing getting me through it are my faith in God, my wonderful, wonderful fans, and my enormous reserve of expendable cash. Three million dollars bail for nonviolent crime. Do you think that's excessive? Joe, any bail is excessive for an innocent man. So you intend to plead not guilty? One hundred percent not guilty. I did not do those things with that boy. Maybe with another boy, but that's not Jermaine here. In fact, Jermaine is waiting in the car with Tito. We're all going for hot wings later. Uh, Mr. Jackson? Call me, Michael. All right, Michael, do you understand why so many people are tempted to prejudge you? You live a very unusual and, uh, unusual and some would say very eccentric lifestyle. You know, Joe, to quote an old Beagle song, which I now own, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. And my water buffalo, and my three zebras, and my... See, there's a case in point. On the Neverland Ranch, you constructed your own zoo. If you want to see animals, why not simply go to the L.A. Zoo? Oh, Joe, because anywhere I go turns into a zoo. I can't go into a hardware store for a pair of plastic gloves and some lubricant without a thousand photographers showing up and wanting a piece of me. Isn't that the price of fame? No. According to my bank account, the price of fame is $350 million. Thank you, fans. All right, but Michael, the money is a double-edged sw uh, sword. It allows you to live your lifestyle, but according to you, it's been the cause of your legal troubles. That's right, Joe. These parents, these adults who are suing me, because I never blame the children, they know I've done nothing wrong, but they have nothing to lose by attacking me. But didn't you foster that perception by paying off uh, Jordy Chandler's family ten years ago? Joe, they had nothing to lose. If they settled out of court, they got money. If they sued me and won, they got money. And if they sued me and lost, they were already broke. What difference would it make to them? But didn't you realize that by settling with one young boy, you opened yourself up to a bunch of other children? I hope you mean that figuratively. Yeah, very funny, but as long as you bring that up, you admitted in a TV interview last year that you sleep with children. You give them milk and cookies, you tuck them in, and you go to sleep with them? That is true. Doesn't that strike you, sir, as just a little strange? Not in the least. People sleep in the same bed with their dogs and cats, and when it's a rainy, thundery night, don't little boys and girls crawl into bed with mommy and daddy? But these aren't your children. Oh, yes, they are. All the children of the world are my children. They're precious angels, uncorrupted by the evils of this world. The Hitlers, the Bin Ladens, the Tommy Matolas. Michael, why don't you walk us through it? On a typical night in Neverland, a little boy came to stay with you. The parents were in another part of the compound. So what happened? Well, first we watched a movie. 
a G-rated movie, and then we played a board game, and then we sat on the couch and listened to one of my recent albums. So you do admit to torture? Joe, I can moonwalk right out of here. Oh, I'm sorry. So then what? It was late, time for bed. Did you read the child a story? Yes, Little Boy Blue. And then you read him a story? Joe? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But you have a private room connected to your bedroom. The camera showed this. And there's all sorts of toys and dolls and child-related pictures and memorabilia. Yes, that's my special hideaway. You went there on that night? Yes. Did the uh, little boy come with you? No, he came first. And then I made him so Oh, wait. Y you meant, sorry, I was thinking of someone else. Something else. Next question. Michael, the smoking gun website has published the court declaration of Jordy Chandler, the first little boy who sued you. In his sworn testimony from 1993, he told the court, quote, I spent the entire weekend with Michael Jackson. We went on jet skis in a small lake he had, uh, saw animals that he kept at Neverland, played video games. He took my mother and me to Toys R Us, and we were allowed to get anything we wanted. Well, what's the harm in that? Well, he goes on to say, quote, one night, Michael Jackson and I watched The Exorcist in Michael Jackson's bedroom. When the movie was over, I was scared. Michael Jackson suggested that I spend the night with him, which I did. Although we slept in the same bed, there was no physical contact. You see? Actually, there was a little contact. I had a small cold, and I asked Jordy to wipe my nose. Why? It was on the nightstand and closer to him than me. All right, well, reading on, quote, my friendship with Michael Jackson became much closer. At Neverland, I would always sleep in bed with Michael Jackson. During our relationship, Michael Jackson had sexual contact with me on, <laughs> on many occasions. I didn't mean to laugh at that, by the way. That's a okay. quote from the court transcripts, and it gets more graphic from, uh, graphic from here. Go on. Oh, my. The first step was simply Michael Jackson hugging me. <laughs> Excuse me, it's an ABC syndrome. You're enjoying this. No, I, uh, I, I, this is my job. Uh, then he'd give me, he goes on to say in the statement, uh, then he'd give me a brief kiss on the cheek. He then started kissing my, uh, kissing me on the lips, first briefly. Then for a longer period of time, he would kiss me while we were in bed together. Go on. I don't really want to. Please. All right. Well, the next step was when, by the way, this is, of course, uh, Jordy Chandler's court statement. The next step was when uh, Michael Jackson put his... <laughs> Excuse me, it's, uh, I'm just thinking of a joke. Uh, it was when Michael Jackson put his tongue in my mouth. I told him I did not like that. Michael Jack... You start, uh, he says you started crying. That's a lie. Crying is so different from pleading. Uh, he goes on to say in this statement, quote, He said there was nothing wrong with it. The next step was when Michael Jackson rubbed up against me in bed. Then uh, we would lie on top of each other with erections. Go on. Please, go on. We took a bath together. Michael Jackson then masturbated in front of me. While we were in bed, Michael Jackson put his hand underneath my underpants. Yes? Yes? He then masturbated me to a climax. After that, Michael Jackson masturbated me many times, both with, with his hand and with his mouth. On one occasion, he grabbed my, he grabbed my buttock and kissed me while he put his tongue in my ear. He had me suck one nipple and twist the other nipple while he masturbated, unquote. Michael? Michael? Uh, you wouldn't happen to have a handy wipe, would you? All right. Well, the testimony ends with the boy saying, quote, Michael Jackson told me I should not tell anyone what happened. He said this was a secret, you know. And did you, uh, did, did you do these things and ask the boy to keep quiet? Lies and falsehoods and fabrications. Can you read that part about the underpants again? Michael, the laws have been changed since last time, and you couldn't settle a case like this out of court even if you wanted to. You're going to have to face these new charges. Oh, I will. And I'll show the world that Michael Jackson is not a rapist. Michael Jackson is not a pedophile. Michael Jackson is not a child molester. And Michael Jackson is not a pervert. Uh, m m Mr. Jackson? Hey, I know my limitations. Michael, I know you have to leave here soon, so let's wrap this up. I'd like to wrap you up, you cute little thing, you. What are you, 15, 16? I'm 20. Quel dommage. Well, leaving aside that, all that controversy, you do have a lot of greatest, uh, you do have a, excuse me, you do have a new greatest hits album out. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Joe. This is for my fans, the wonderful people who still believe in me, who don't care about my sex life, who don't care about me being a role model for the black community. 
Mr. Jackson, you've had so many operations, you're wider than I am. I am? Oh my gosh, you're right. No wonder my penis got shorter. All right, well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to a special news break. The one and only Michael Jackson joining us in the studio, telling his side of the story. Mr. Jackson, I thank you uh, for coming on my program. I wish you the best of luck. You will need it. I know, but I have faith. I have hope. I have lawyers that could buy and sell your listeners like Christmas toys on eBay. Actually, reports say that you chose Mark Garagos as your defense counsel. I'm surprised you didn't uh, hire Johnny Cochran since he did so well with another celebrity trial. Well, I did consult with Johnny, and he gave me some great advice. Phrases we could use were media spin during the trial. He's so good at that. What do you mean by phrases? If there ain't no semen, the kid was dreaming. If it's just masturbation, it ain't molestation, because it's okay to be it. Just don't eat it. All right, I think we got the picture. I did not put my pole in the boy's booty hole. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jackson, thank you so much for stopping by. If the boy didn't suck it, this man... Well, all right, that's enough of that. Shut up, please. I'm Joe Salzone. You're listening to 1240 WGBB Freeport. And as we get ready for Dave's Gone By, we now return to your regular broadcast. As soon, as soon as we can get the intro started, as soon as that happens... Uh, as a matter of fact, I think now Dave might just be ready for his, uh, for his show. Good evening, everybody! Welcome to Dave's Gone By. Rubba Rubba. 90 minutes of talk radio, comedy, music, gratitudes and platitudes on this pre-Thanksgiving edition brought to you by Total Theater and Performing Arts Insider Magazine. Silly talk, smart talk, special talk, and music every Monday night, 6.30 to 8 p.m. on AM 1240 WGBB and AM 1240 WGBB.com. You can get it on your radio and on your computer. You can get it in your car and in your office. You can get it in your cavity fillings and your turkey stuffing. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you can give thanks because Dave's Gone By is ubiquitous and unique, and all you need to do is keep your dial right here for the next hour and a half and let me do the rest. And what will I be doing? Well, pretty much the usual, and some of the unusual. We'll do some gabbing about Thanksgiving, of course, and we'll play some appropriate seasonal music. No, don't worry, I'm not going to play Alice's Restaurant. I'm not Pete for Natal, and I don't have to take a 20-minute pee break. I wish I could write a song that DJs feel obligated to play every single time the holiday rolls around. It becomes a kind of immortality. Whether people want to hear it or not, they have to hear it, because not playing it would break tradition. It's like Old Lang Syne on New Year's Day, or Tony Bennett doing the Christmas song on... Christmas. I gotta hand it to Adam Sandler. Not only is he a pretty funny guy a lot of the time, but he saw the need. He realized that right around Christmas time, Jews get sh sick to death of hearing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Freakin' Snowman and Ave Diarrhea, especially now that the so-called Christmas spirit starts in the middle of November. I mean, it's not even Thanksgiving yet. And there's already radio stations brainwashing potential shoppers with Winter Wonderland and Jingle Bell Rock. The day after Halloween, après pumpkin, na déluge. Somehow a guy named Randy Brooks managed at least to sneak in a deranged novelty tune. So, mixed in among all the hymns and Bing Crosby ballads, you'll suddenly hear Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer which is pretty twisted for a holiday standard, I must say. But even then, a big chunk of the population gets left out around this time, forced to listen to crappy Christmas music in every elevator, shopping mall, bank, and office building. So Adam Sandler said, you know what? I grew up Jewish all those years, having to tolerate the, this goyish music they were dumping on me, whether I wanted to hear it or not. I'm going to write a Hanukkah song. One that isn't Dragle, Dragle, Dragle. And he did, of course, the Hanukkah song. And it's become a juggernaut, one of the most popular numbers in his repertoire, deservedly. He's done a sequel song. He's released different versions of it. He still goes on Saturday Night Live to update it. And what's happened? <clears throat> it is now a tradition. If it's Hanukkah time and you're Jewish or not Jewish, you have to hear Adam Sandler's Hanukkah song at least once. And that rule is written on the same tablets 
on which they prescribe that rock stations have to play John Lennon's Happy Christmas War is Over every year, even though we'd all rather hear whatever gets you through the night. So, okay, <clears throat> John Lennon got his immortal holiday song, and Adam Sandler did too. He also tried it with the animated movie, A Crazy Nights. I haven't seen it, but judging by the reviews, he didn't quite manage to equal It's a Wonderful Life or White Christmas. Mannequin, too, maybe. Anyway, this was all brought to mind last week when Engineer Joe, the wonderful Joe Salzone, who's behind the board tonight and uh, almost every Monday night, thank goodness, I was hanging out after my program last Monday. <coughs> Pardon me. You know what, Joe? I think I can use my theme music right now. Is it queued up by any chance? Let's see. Just <coughs> cue that baby up if you can. Well, maybe not. There we go. The following program is brought to you by Total Theater Online. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the staff or management of WGBB. You're listening to the station that serves your community, 1240 WGBB. And now it's time for Dave's Gone By with David Lepkowitz. And now back to Dave. Yeah, hey, back there. Sorry about that, folks. A little, several, a turkey in my throat. It's a Thanksgiving kind of a frog. Anyway, I was hanging out after my program last <clears throat> Monday and listening to The Cooking Show. Chef Armand has a program here Monday nights at 8.30. A lot of times it's on tape, but this one was live. So Armand and the Sour Broughton King. Now, I couldn't make that up if I wanted to. Armand and his co-host, the <clears throat> Sour Broughton King, spent much of the show talking about the Thanksgiving meal, how to cook a turkey and all that. And I have to say, there were some really great ideas. Like, did you know you could fry a turkey, get the oil really boiling, dump the bird in there, and it cooks very quickly and stays really juicy because the skin gets crisp and seals in the succulents. And that's not the only way to keep a bird moist. You can blow in its ear. No, but you can, when you're cooking it, turn it over about three-quarters of the way through. This keeps the top from burning and drying out. Also, because certain parts of the turkey cook a lot faster than others, you can cover, like the wings and drumsticks, with tinfoil and let the breast meat cook a little longer. Great ideas from Armand and the Sour Broughton King. I just love saying that. And they also talked about stuffing made of apple cider donuts. Swear to God, you crush a bunch of apple cider donuts and use that to stuff the inside of the turkey. Well, who knew? I guess the same people who discovered you can bake a ham and Coca-Cola. But anyway, during a break in the cooking show, Engineer Joe turned to me and said, Dave, why do people love you and hate me? And I said, Joe, here's a list. No, no, Joe is one of the most popular people at the station and on the air. But he did turn to me that night and he asked, Dave, do you know any Thanksgiving songs? There are four gazillion Christmas songs, but I, I can't think of any Thanksgiving songs to play on my show over the weekend. And I really had to think for a minute. Now, the only one I could come up with was, well, you know, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh. Da, 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 da. Anyway, I don't think anyone remembers the rest of that song. There are like three verses to it. I checked a couple of sites on the Internet, and go figure, it's actually a Christmas song. People morphed it into a Thanksgiving tune because they mention a big meal and pumpkin pie, but the second verse is, over the river and through the woods to have a full day of play, oh, hear the bells ringing, ting-a-ling-ling, for it is Christmas Day. Funny, we didn't sing that verse when I went to Hebrew elementary school, but people have co-opted it for Thanksgiving because we don't have any other Thanksgiving songs. Think about it. That's why Alice's Restaurant Massacre... Alice. Remember Alice? That's why Arlo, the Arlo Guthrie song is such an obvious song for airplay. It's the only choice. Unless you want to sing Ten Little Indians, which would still be politically incorrect even if you changed it to Ten Vertically Challenged Native Americans. Now, Adam Sandler, trying to match his Hanukkah success, wrote a cute Thanksgiving song, but it's no standard. And I wish I could say that I'd written a Thanksgiving song that I could contribute, but I racked my brain couldn't manage it. So I went through my record collection and tried to find some appropriate candidates. Not in a jokey way. 
I just figured maybe there are songs that fit the spirit of the holiday, what we're supposed to keep in mind and treasure and care about. I came up with a couple. One is a tad trite, but that's appropriate for the holiday. And if you go in that spirit, it's a very sweet little tune. And the other, well, who the hell knows what Al Alanis Morissette is ever talking about, but at least she sounds grateful. to hear a couple of songs about appreciating what you have, the people and things and activities of your life, as John Denver put it in Poems, Prayers, and Promises, and the internal stuff, the personal strength and focus that gets you through the day that Alanis Morissette sings about in Thank You. 
and thank you for being with me on this pre-Erev Thanksgiving episode of Dave's Gone By. Comedy, music, talk radio, that's the modus operandi on this program, which has been airing on AM 1240 WGBB Freeport and AM 1240 WGBB.com since October 2002, for which I am abundantly grateful. And I do give thanks for all the good things I have in my life, when I'm not bemoaning and bitching about them, I admit, And I do appreciate the idea behind the holiday of Thanksgiving, even if there's now a layer of political incorrectness to it because of the whole Americans versus Native Americans thing. Now, for some people, Thanksgiving is an immoral holiday, since it celebrates colonialism and the vanquishing of indigenous peoples. But it's helpful to remember that although we think of Turkey Day as a very American thing, you know, thank you for the harvest that saved the pilgrims, Thank you for the friendly Indians who got them through the winter. Actually, the concept for a holiday of gratitude goes back to ancient times. Back then, they were known as harvest festivals. The ancient Greeks had one, the festival of Themisphoria, which paid homage to Demeter, goddess of corn and grain. According to the website holidays.net, on the first day of the festival, married women would build a leafy shelter, much like the huts the Jews build on Sukkot. Another harvest holiday. Anyway, the second day of the Greek festival was spent fasting, but the third day was a feast day, utilizing all the crops that Demeter made possible. Later on, the Romans had their own holiday, Cerealia, honoring Ceres, the goddess of corn, and yes, that's where we ultimately get the word cereal. Anyway, they had the same kind of feast festival with music, parades, games, and sports. Now think of it. 2,000 years later, on Thanksgiving, just like the Romans, we still throw people to the lions. Only, usually it's the patriots and you have to give three points. But seriously, I mentioned Sukkot, the the Jewish holiday, that's more than 3,000 years old. Now, the small huts of leaves and branches, the Sukkot, they have a religious significance related to the makeshift shelters Hebrews used when leaving Egypt. But it was also a harvest holiday with families eating lots of fruits and vegetables in these dwellings. Egyptians celebrate the festival of Min, M-I-N, with dancing and parades. Even the Chinese have a Thanksgiving holiday, the 15th day of the 8th month, which they consider the birthday of the moon. In the old days, they baked special round yellow moon cakes and feast on roasted pig and harvested fruits. And their ancient ancestors had even one more reason to be grateful. According to legend, at one time, China was battling a conquering, invading army. People were starving, homeless, desperate. They had no choice but to attack the enemy and fight back. All the women baked special mooncakes and tucked in secret messages to the soldiers, telling them exactly what time to attack. They surprised the invaders, won the war and gave their thanks through this moon celebration. But okay, what about the Americans? In 1620, after about two months at sea, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, near Cape Cod in Massachusetts. They were Englishmen. They moved to Holland to avoid religious persecution, and then they ran away from Holland because the Dutch weren't religious enough. Remember, these were the crucible people we're talking about. And anyway, geniuses, they weren't, because they'd set sail in September and landed in mid-November, just in time for winter. A winter that they were not prepared for, and more than half of them died. Those who made it through to the following March saw their luck finally change when Somerset, an Abnaki Indian, walked into their camp and bid them welcome, in English. He later brought over his pal, Squanto, who had traveled back and forth between Europe and the so-called New World. Well, Squanto was the pilgrim's man Friday, who taught them how to fish, which plants were poisonous, how to tap maple trees for syrup, how to plant corn, etc., etc., and how. And it's worth noting that the pilgrims didn't have a problem coexisting with the Indians, not the Abnaki or the Potoxet. Their trouble started when the Dutch West India Company sent over settlers to colonize what we now know as Manhattan. They bought it assumedly with an offer the engines couldn't refuse, for the Dutch equivalent of 24 bucks. But as the colony grew, they still needed more land. Owing to inflation, the Indians probably wanted 
oh, I don't know, $27 for it. But the colonists didn't want to pay retail. They preferred killing a lot of women and children instead. And by the 1630s, the massacres and deliberate genocide of Native Americans had begun, continuing all the way to 1890, when 300 hearts were buried at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. Would you like more stuffing with that, Mr. Standish? <laughs> Thanksgiving and thanks taking on Dave's Gone By. We heard a Sioux Indian war dance. Those were the folks who got slaughtered at Wounded Knee. You heard that one guy coughing. I think he was on his last legs already. And uh, I guess they didn't dance quite well enough, especially since the United States Army fired on the Sioux while they were busy trying to surrender. Now, before that, Neil Young from the Rust Never Sleeps collection, Pocahontas, certainly expressing the cynicism of the whole us-versus-them disaster of how the West was truly won, and the East, and the Middle. But let's roll back to better times in American-Indian relations, back when Squanto taught the pilgrims a thing or two about gardening. He visited the settlers in March of 1620, and six months later, harvest time, what a bounty of smoked meats and vegetables and fruits and provisions to store for the winter they had. 
Governor William Bradford proclaimed a day of Thanksgiving for mid-October, with both the pilgrims and the Indians celebrating together for three days of games and music and feasting. Everything was fine for the following year, but the third year had a very hot and dry summer. The pilgrims got real nervous about the crops that were dying in the field, so Governor Bradford ordered a day of prayer and fasting. But what do you know? Eventually the rains came and the crops were saved. And that fall, November 29th, was proclaimed the official day of Thanksgiving. It remained kind of an optional thing until the 1800s, when New York State adopted it as an annual custom, and it was President Lincoln who made it a national holiday. And the interesting thing is, it isn't one particular date. It isn't always the 29th. In fact, it usually winds up on the 26th or 28th, or in this year's case, the 27th. It's the fourth Thursday of each November, but technically the present president has to proclaim it. If he really wanted to, he could proclaim it for August 12th. But tradition is tradition, and tradition dictates it's the fourth Thursday of November. And we have a couple of traditions here on this program, Dave's Gone By. How's that for a segue? And we will partake of said traditions most gratefully over the remaining time of the show. One of them is the News Gone By, a look at world events in a humorous way that's roughly 15 minutes from now with stories about a naked photographer, the Prime Minister of Finland, a guy who foiled a robbery with a beer bottle, a genetically altered tropical fish, a new flavor of soda, and an old pile of meatloaf. All that coming up on the news gone by. Also, a semi-recurring tradition on this program, the World Weird Web. And I picked out a website that's especially morbidly apt for the tone and tenor of this episode. That's coming up in just a moment or two. Another tradition is to remind listeners, if you haven't guessed already, that this program, Dave's Gone By, is rated DGB-13. Nothing offensive or obscene, nothing you can't listen to at grandmother's house, but you might not be 100% comfortable if grandma's listening. So, you know, keep an extra diaper handy. And the last tradition, perhaps the most important one, the one by whose grace we are able to keep all the other traditions, I mean, of course, the tradition of commercials. Two of them, And when they're done, we tuck into our audio feast with the World Weird Web. So thanks for tuning in back after this. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. Dave Lefkowitz here, as I am every Monday night from 6.30 to 8 p.m. on AM 1240 WGBB Freeport and AM 1240 WGBB.com. One of the recurring segments we do on this program that we haven't done in a long time is the World Weird Web. That's where we visit a URL on the internet that I find particularly fun or odd or helpful or whacked out. And tonight, I've actually found one that is all of the above. And I want to thank Helene for bringing it to my attention email-wise. What better place to visit this Thanksgiving week when we're all concerned with the good spirit of America and the gathering of families and the joys of winter and the holiday season? Well, what better place to surf our mouses? and to a site that completely negates all that in a gently sarcastic way. Maybe you've heard of this company. They've been around, apparently, since 2000, founded and operated by a guy named Dr. E.L. Kirsten. Not sure if that's a real name or just a spokesperson-y front, but next time you're at your computer, or maybe you're there now, surf all over to despair.com, www.despair.com. I'll read what's on the homepage. Dr. Kirsten's personal message to visitors of the site. For longer than most of us can remember, motivational speakers, authors, and publishers have inspired and delighted us by championing championing the idea that within each person exists virtually unlimited potential. At Despair Incorporated, we agree wholeheartedly. Think about it. What hidden potentials exist within you? Perhaps... You're a wholly reasonable person with the potential to become an irrational fool. Perhaps you're a team player with a potentially argumentative loner lurking about inside you. Or perhaps you're a dreamer within whom lives a potentially disillusioned grouse simply waiting to take flight on the wings of bitterness. No matter who you are, you have the potential 
to be so very much less. And with the transformative powers of our demotivators products, you will be. Whether you're a pessimist, underachiever, or a chronic failure, I personally offer my unconditional guarantee that demotivators will truly inspire you to new lows. Unquote. Okay, cute idea, but what really sells the website, apart from it being quite professionally and nicely put together, is that the merchandise they sell is as pretty and high quality as stuff you get from stationery companies and museum gift shops. The material is branded demotivators. They even have a little trademark R in a circle after the word so nobody steals it. And the tagline is, demotivators increasing success by lowering expectations. And how do they do that? With calendars and note cards and sticky pads, all with uninspirational messages and really lovely but ironic photographs to go along with the sayings. For example, their 2004 calendar has monthly pages for things like achievement, ambition, discovery, persistence, potential, power, success, and teamwork. But don't be fooled by these positivities. Achievement, for instance, shows a beautiful photo of the pyramids with the word achievement under them in big gold letters. Under that, the true message. You can do anything you set your mind to when you have vision, determination, and an endless supply of expendable labor. I'm surprised they didn't just put a Nike shoe over that, but you get the idea. Then there's the page for nepotism, with a lion and a cub nestled together in the grass. We promote family values here, the tagline reads, almost as often as we promote family members. For the word retirement, there's a gorgeous picture of a chewed-up nub of a lead pencil lying on a lacquered wooden desk. Retirement, because you've given so much of yourself to the company that you don't have anything left we can use. Now, how'd you like to look at that for a month after working at a place for 20 years? Are you getting the picture why this company is called Despair Inc.? Well, they sell coffee mugs, too, of course, including the Pessimist's Mug. You can probably guess this one. It's a glass coffee cup with a line down the middle and the words, This glass is now half empty. Says company founder E.L. Kirsten, Wow, the Pessimist's Mug really makes everything taste bitter. Well, hopefully not the candies they sell on the site. They've got those little tiny sugar hearts that you get on uh, on Valentine's Day. Only instead of I love you or you're the best, the despair hearts read, you're my trophy, up your dosage, just a friend, and my favorite, return my CDs. As the website says, bittersweets are made of flavored, chalky-tasting sugar stamped with bitter musings and mockeries perfectly suited to the dejected spirits who will spend their holidays alone or wish they were. Candy for the rest of us, it's called. Supplies are limited, but the pain that accompanies them may not be. i
The Despair.com website also sells really stunning lithographs and prints, and I'm not kidding or being sarcastic. Take a look at the site, Despair.com. The photography is often breathtaking, but the messages are breath-deflating. They have posters hailing underachievement, procrastination, mediocrity, and cluelessness, and award plaques like the underperformance plaque for, quote, employees who fall short so very far short of even the lowest expectations of others, unquote. Screensavers, too. Why should your computer be happy when the rest of you is miserable, right? So you can load up screensavers like Insanity, with a picture of a parachute guy free-falling down a mountain with his chute closed. The tagline, it's difficult to comprehend how insane some people can be, especially when you're insane. Defeat. For every winner, there are dozens of losers. Odds are you're one of them. And of course, how could we leave out despair, with its exquisite picture of a winding lake at sundown? Despair. It's always darkest just before it goes pitch black. Okay, so maybe things are going well for you. Good job, healthy family, productive hobbies, and you're content but still a little ambitious, grateful to God for his goodness, and really feeling positive about yourself and your situation. Well, screw you. The rest of us have to go through Thanksgiving, and I'm glad there are websites like Despair.com to commiserate with. www.despair.com And this was not a commercial for the site. I was just impressed and amused enough to let you all know about it. So you can jump online and have your own Thanksgiving Day Parade of Misery. And hey, if you come across a wild, wacky, and wonderful, or tender, touching, and tickling website that you think your fellow listeners should know about, email me the URLs and let me know. Dave's gone by at AOL.com. Dave's gone by, no apostrophe, at AOL.com. And just like Despair.com, they can be part of that international select few that we showcase on this segment, The World Weird Web. It's time for the news gone by. A look at world and local events of the past week from a Pilgrim's progressive perspective. Well, let's see. What was big in the news this week? Um, no, nothing much. What? what? Huh? What? Michael who? Uh, oh, yeah. Michael Jackson was arrested this week on charges that he sexually molested a 12-year-old boy who was dying of cancer. <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. I mean, it's not as if he practiced medical experiments on the kid and then flayed the skin off him with a boat hook, but uh, cut Michael some slack, and I truly wish the media would. Really, not the entertainment programs, like this one. Satire and opinion is fair game. But the so-called news programs and networks, Fox, the Entertainment Tonight clones, Michael Jackson, I shouldn't even have to say this, but he's innocent until proven guilty. That's the way it works, even though he paid off the last kid, even though he admits to sleeping with children, even though his Neverland Ranch is a Xanadu of psychotically arrested development. Look, Michael Jackson is baggier than a vampire high school reunion, but until he has either admitted guilt or been found guilty, his situation should be reported objectively. Now, if you ask my opinion, well... I wouldn't be surprised if Michael Jackson has opened up more diapers than Ronald Reagan's night nurse. 
And even if he's guilty, he might get off. He squeezed out of trouble last time with what essentially was a bribe. And considering what happened with O.J. and Robert Durst, Jackson's got a good legal shot to wriggle away, even if he used the cancer kid's crotch for a trampoline. Now, the King of Pop is currently out on $3 million bail, which is about 50 bucks for the rest of us. And his defense, of course, is going to try and prove that the accuser's family is just out for money. After all, said Jermaine Jackson in a TV interview, if the last kid really was molested and emotionally scarred for life, why did his loving and caring parents jump at a cash settlement? On the other hand, when TV cameras were allowed into the Jackson compound, Neverland, they discovered a secret room just off Michael Jackson's personal bedroom. No, there were no sex gadgets or preteen porn tapes or anything like that, so far as we've been told. Just a lot of dolls and stuffed toys and baby furniture, pictures of young children cut out of magazines, and a shrine, and I'm not making this up, a veritable shrine to Macaulay Culkin, the, the Home Alone tyke. Now, this is the kind of place you half expect Ice-T and Richard Belzer to break in there and go, oh yeah, this is our guy. And the biggest irony is that the search on Neverland and the arrest of Michael Jackson came the same day the self-proclaimed King of Pop had released a new single titled, get this, One More Chance, and a greatest hits album called Number Ones. You can bet if Jackson goes to prison as a child molester, he better seal up the place he does number twos. More legal news, also coincidentally involving $3 million. Two years ago, Joseph Tomino of Neptune, New Jersey, was awarded three mil in a lawsuit against the Male Sexual Dysfunction Institute of Chicago. Must be a little wing of the Art Institute, I guess. The jury said he deserved the big payout because Tomino was undergoing treatments there, and it wasn't that they didn't work. They worked all too well. He was left with a constant erection that lasted three days until he was forced to go for surgery to bring that puppy down. The Institute appealed, and while an appeals court upheld Tomino's victory, they said his $3 million award should be reduced because even though he can't perform in bed, he can still do sports and live normally otherwise. Well, the appellate judge, I don't know why Joe loves this story, but okay. Well, the appellate judge did reduce the award by one penny. He said he thought Tomino deserved an even bigger award considering what he went through. An appeals panel, probably all women, they took the case away from that second judge and are forcing a third judge to comply with the appeal and reduce the award by a significant amount. They said rejecting the spirit of the law is just too hard on the penal system, at which point Mr. Tomino said, hard on? Penal system? That's why we're here! Thank you, Joe, my best audience, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the international incident of the week. The Prime Minister of Finland, Mati Van Hanen, set off a controversy when Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Kazyanov and his wife came for dinner. Van Hanen is a dyed-in-the-wool teetotaler, no alcohol. So instead of serving his Russian guests the standard wine or vodka with a meal, he served apple juice. Van Hanen felt this was justified because the dinner was at his home and he didn't want his children assuming alcohol had to be part of a meal. But a member of the Russian Chamber of Commerce railed at the insult, telling Reuters, quote, Vodka is an integral part of the dinner setting in Russia. Wine can be skipped. Vodka can't. Unquote. Well, as a non-drinker myself, ordinarily I'd stand firm with Van Hanen and say he has the right to keep his meals alcohol-free. But then I read that the dinner he served the Russian Prime Minister consisted of three things. Apple juice, water, and elk steak. Quite honestly, if I were the Russian diplomat, to stomach that, I'd want a fifth of vodka, six whiskeys, and a quart of Kitty Dukakis brand shoe polish. In crime news, Chicago police have finally captured the naked photographer. That's right, a camera-carrying man who wears only sunglasses and a cap and runs around taking pictures of startled women. 33-year-old Stephen Lennon was arrested last Wednesday in the laundry room of an apartment complex. He just snapped his 39th victim 
Well, she grabbed the stocking cap off his head and ran to call the cops. So a police spokesperson, and this is a quote, he just pops up, flashes the camera, laughs, and runs off, unquote. Asked if she was surprised or embarrassed by her husband's behavior, Mrs. Lingen told the press it was no different from their regular, rather bad sex life. After all, she said, all he ever does is zoom in and zoom out again with no time for anything to develop. More crime news. A big vigilante ole to Umberto Pineda of Uniondale. He was standing inside a food store, sipping a tall, cool bottle of Model Especial. That's when a 16-year-old robber entered the establishment, pulled out a gun, and started grabbing the wallets and cell phones of every customer in the place. When the thief, named Prince Johnson, went for the cash register, Pineda snuck up behind him and bashed him on the cabeza with a beer. The bottle broke, the beer spritzed, the criminal was subdued, and Pineda saved the day. Asked how he felt about foiling a holdup using beer as a weapon, Pineda said, Hey, he's lucky I didn't have a Colt 45. I used to feel like a St. Pauli girl with a natural light bush, but now I feel like a lone star standing on Olympia. And you know, I think I've made the neighborhood just a little bit shaper. See? See? Señoras y señoras, aplauso, este es el comedy bell. Actually, they're the comedy keys tonight because I couldn't get to my bag. But yes, they signal the L. Dave's gone by. Bad pun of La Semana. Getting a thumbs down from Joe. Every I should have done it on one of the sex ones. I know. Every week we make a make a play on words so hopped up, so ailing that we can't help mug our way through it. And we do it by ringing El Comedy Bell, or in this case, Los Comedy Keys. <laughs> It's stupid, it's annoying, <laughs> it's infantile, and hundreds of people look forward to it each and every week. And if you want to reach those demented people with your message, if you want to tell them why they should eat at your restaurant, use your printing company, hire your band for their Sweet 16, then the days gone by, Bad Pun of the Week is the place to do it. Associate your product, business, or service with this program. The rates are cheap. The uh, process is painless, the results unmistakable week after week. By now you know that the Tondora Grill has been advertising on this show for a while, and damned if I didn't get a couple of listeners telling me, hey yeah, we visited it, we heard about it on your show and wanted to check it out. It was very good. That's how it works. You advertise, people listen. After a few times, the message becomes mantra, it sinks in, and eventually people respond and they buy. So help support this program and help support yourself by advertising on Dave's Gone By. Considering sponsor, bleh, consider sponsoring a segment like the World Weird Web, the theater reviews on Dave's Gone Cultural, maybe the birthday salutes, and maybe the Dave's Gone By bad pun of the week. Call 516-295-1511 to find out how. Area code 516-295-1511. We'll give you the rates, we'll give you the rules, we'll give you the business. Wait, let me rephrase that. 516-295-1511 or email Dave's Gone By at AOL.com and learn how you can reach a multitude of listeners and make them bend to your will or even your William. Dave's Gone By at AOL.com to sponsor the Dave's Gone By Bad Pun of the Week. Don't be good, be ponderful. Okay, here's today's political puzzler. How do you fix an education system in decline? One that in many cases stops preparing young people for life, let alone college? And how do you do it without breaking taxpayers' backs or selling your children's souls to giant corporations? How do you do it? Well, if you're Colorado Senator Ron Tech, you don't. Senator Tech is floating the idea, very seriously, of eliminating the 12th grade. His idea is to add a mandatory year of preschool and then get everybody out the door at the end of 11th grade. Well, it's true, kids are growing up faster these days, and there are social skills they might learn in preschool that come in handier later in life than calculus ever will, but really are there so many available jobs out there that we can unleash an entire year's worth of 16-year-olds into the workforce? And do we have to put the burden on colleges to offer the high-level courses students didn't get as seniors in high school? 
Senator Tech told the Associated Press that eliminating 12th grade prepares kids for college by giving them an early start. Huh? Oh, and it also saves money. Ah, finally a break from the BS. I'd really like to see us change the model, said the senator. Quote, we've been operating under the same educational model for the last hundred years, unquote. It's a valid point. Although the senator did misspell the words operating education and years, just kidding, but on the positive side, by starting the education process earlier, tuxedo renters and limousine companies are eagerly bracing for the inevitable pre-sophomore prom, which will take place at the end of third grade. The best part is, at that age, the condoms almost never break. Speaking of youngsters, let's test your news gone by IQ, shall we? Don't worry, this is an easy one. It's multiple choice, and I guarantee you're gonna know the answer. Last Wednesday, a 13-year-old girl from Massapequa was visiting her young cousin in North Amityville. Her cousin wanted to show off, so he pried open a locked box in his parents' bedroom and found his father's handgun. Okay, here's the quiz. What do you think happened? A. The boy felt so guilty for opening the box, he put the gun on the kitchen table and waited there for his parents to come home, at which point he cried and begged forgiveness. B. The boy was so shocked and scared at seeing a firearm, he called the police to remove it from the premises. C. The boy got nervous and quickly put the gun back and hoped his dad wouldn't notice the busted lock. And D. The boy played with the gun, showed off for his cousin, and accidentally shot her in the face. <laughs> Joe is shouting D. Well, you know, if you said A or B, what world are you living in? If you said C, what decade are you living in? But like Joe, if you said D, he's the newsman, he gets the cigar, and you get an A. Yes, living, the, the, the boy put a bullet through the side of his cousin's face, landing her in critical condition at Stony Brook University Hospital. Now, if there's any upside to the story, is that there was no sexual assault or incest involved, so the boy may have put a hole in her face, but at least he didn't put his face... Well, anyway, in science news, a 15-year study at Northwestern University has shown that people who are impatient or hostile face a longer-term risk for high blood pressure. Doctors theorize that irascible behavior causes the nervous system to hyperreact, thus increasing the heart rate and narrowing the blood vessels. The recommendation, of course, is to relax, to de-stress. Joe, um, do we have that clip I wanted to play about the... Joe, the clip, the one I gave you before the show. What, what, Joe, what do you... Excuse me, folks. Why do I do all this work if I can't get a lousy freaking sound bite on the air, huh? I mean, what do I have to do to get a little respect around here so I can do my goddamn show? Anyway, doctors say being hostile, being cantankerous, can lead to real health problems. So please, everyone, take time to mellow out and don't sweat the small stuff. It's just not worth it. In entertainment news... The big holiday movie opening this week is the classic Dr. Seuss children's book brought to life, Mike Myers in The Cat in the Hat. Anticipating a monster hit, Universal DreamWorks is already planning a Broadway musical sequel starring Rosie O'Donnell, the fat in the ass. <laughs> yes, thank you, Joe. I, yeah. Speaking of which, 56-year-old rock performer Meatloaf collapsed on stage in London last Monday. Doctors diagnosed him with a mild viral infection exacerbated by obesity and exhaustion. However, fans sitting closest to the stage said Meatloaf went into shock. Apparently, he suddenly realized just how much his music sucks. <laughs> Joe's keys are now flapping. That wasn't a pun! Okay, it's that special time in the news gone by when we pluck a story from the syndicated Weird But True column published locally in the New York Post. Creepy as a snake in the grass might be, imagine if you had to deal with a snake in the mouth. Well, Jack Bibby of Whiskey Flats, Texas has no problem with that. He just beat his own world record by stuffing the tails of nine live rattlesnakes into his mouth. He already has the world record for sitting in a bathtub filled with live snakes, 75 of them. Bibby told reporters he could probably fit 12 or 13 snake tails into his mouth, but no more. My mouth is only so big, he said, prompting actor Harvey Firestein to say, Silly boy, it isn't the mouth, it's all throat control. 
Oh, well, what the heck, let's have another weird but true story. The San Francisco Aquarium recently threw a birthday party for a fish, an Australian lungfish named Methuselah, that arrived at the aquarium already fully grown all the way back in 1938. That makes the creature at least 65 years old and the oldest fish in captivity. Unless, of course, you count Joan Collins. But seriously, we go now from the oldest fish to the newest. Scientists at Yorktown Technologies announced last week that they have bred the first genetically engineered tropical fish. They've taken the common zebrafish that you can get at any pet store and mutated it so that it glows fluorescent red in the dark. They didn't do it just for show. The fish are meant to ease environmental pollution because they glow most bright when they get near toxins. Strong sales are expected for the new zebras, especially in Long Island's Suffolk County, where the fish not only glow, they pulsate and burst. Well, finally, in the news gone by, remember when the rock group Primus tried to gross everybody out by naming their 1993 album Pork Soda? Well, a beverage company in Seattle has gone that one better. In the past, they've already done sodas that taste like blue bubblegum, green apple, and crushed melon. Actually, that last one sounds kind of nice. And they have a page on their website, jonessoda.com, where they ask people to vote on ideas for new flavors they're thinking of creating, like blackberry cream or Jamaican ginger ale. But they topped them all last week. That's when the Jones Soda Company rolled out the debut of its holiday special, turkey and gravy-flavored soda. I kid you not, there's a picture of it on my website. Check it out, hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. Reuters reports that consumers snapped up the specialty drink for about $6 a bottle. Turkey and gravy soda is actually meat-free. It's tan-colored and apparently tastes like, well, a carbonated Thanksgiving dinner. Most unusual thing is that with it, free of charge, you also get vomit soda. (laughs) It's really just the turkey and gravy soda, 30 seconds after you pack it. Oh, yes, I got to kind of close on that one. That's the news gone by for November 24th, 2003. Please send your comments, opinions, and meatloaf CDs to Dave's Gone By, P.O. Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062. You know, it's such an instantaneous world with phone calls and email and voicemail. It's actually a real kick to get mail mail. I don't mean bulk mail or bills or even press releases, but a card, a letter, a check. So make me happy. Give me something in my mailbox. Box 62, Unit New York, 11557-0062. And if you want to go the quick and easy way, that's cool too. Email Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. Dave's Gone By, no apostrophe, at AOL.com. We reserve the right to read your letters and emails on the air, name withheld upon request. I look forward to getting your stuff, but please, no elk steak. I'm allergic. Back after this. You get parodies and sketches, interviews and fetches. Check our website listing and you'll find your faves airing week after week. Every show was unique. (laughs) Those were the good old days. That's right. So many great moments on past episodes of Dave's Gone By. Now they're archived, many of them digitally recorded and available on audio cassette. Special guests like October Project, zany sketches like the Puff Sullivan Letter, and songs like making poopies. Classic episodes of Dave's Gone By, only $12 with discounts if you buy more than one. Check the website hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By for a detailed inventory of past shows or email Dave's Gone By at aol.com. If you want to have fun, buy my tapes, everyone. Those were the good old Dave's. Why don't you get back here? Why don't you get back here? Reasons to be cheerful, part three. One, two, three. Summer Buddy Holly, the working folly, the golly Miss Molly, and boats. Hammersmith Polly, the Bolshoi Bally, jump back in the alley, and nanny dogs. Major Miller's camels, Dominica camels, all other mammals plus equal boats. 
Team Piccadilly, Fanny Smith and Willie, Beer and Marble City, and Porridge Oats. Ready for Grin and Bear, I bet you come and share it. You're welcome, we can spare it. Yellow socks, short to be haughty, nutty to be naughty. Going on forty, no electric shot. The juice of the carrot, the smile of the parrot, a little drop of parrot, anything that works. Elvis and Scotty, days when I ain't spotty, sitting on the potty, curing smallpox. Please easy to be cheerful, that's free. Easy to be cheerful, that's free. Easy to be cheerful, that's free. Easy to be cheerful. One, two, three. Reasons to be cheerful. Part three. Health service classes, gigolos and brasses, round or skinny bottoms. Take him on to Paris, lighting up the chalice. We Willie Harris. Man to Stephen Beacon, listening to Rico. Harpo Groucho Chico. Cheddar cheese and pickle, the Vincent motorcycle. Slap and pickle. Woody Allen Darley, Dimitri and Pasquale. Bala 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 and the love. Sunday nice to study, phoning up a buddy, being in my nutty. Saying okie dokie, sing along a smoky, coming out a chokey. John Coltrane Soprano, Eddie Chalampano, Bona Carino. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Reasons to be cheerful, one, two, three. Yes, reasons to be cheerful, courtesy of the late Ian Dury. It's my way of looking at Thanksgiving, finding reasons to be cheerful, to be grateful, to be tolerant, to be helpful, to be content. In other words, to be ten times better than I am 364 other days of year. But hey, it's a start, and I'll say this. If I'm stuffing myself with roast turkey, gorging on an apple pie, watching football on TV, having a nice walk with my wife, playing with my dogs and thinking up things to do on this show, I've got a lot of reasons to be cheerful and thankful, and I'll bet you do too. So enjoy this Thanksgiving. Take it in the best spirit. And remember, even the pilgrims needed a four-day weekend now and then, and even the Indians didn't know what to do with all that leftover buffalo on the third day. And folks, I have a couple of leftovers to take care of tonight before I clear the table for 21st Century Radio happening at 8, or it's 21st Century Music, I think. Something like that. First, I must remind you, as I do every week, that this show is a lot more fun for me when I have contact from you. I'm on here 90 minutes a week, but the rest of the time, I'm not at the station. I'm in a vacuum, so far as the show is concerned. So I need to hear from you to know what you liked, what you didn't, what you want more of, less of, or just the same of. And I'm easier to reach than the cranberry sauce across the table. Just email davesgoneby at aol.com. Dave's gone by, no apostrophe, at AOL.com. Got a couple of letters last week, one from Piero in Gibson, New York. Piero was apparently listening to my eulogy for Art Carney and says, that's a great Norton imitation, do Barney Rubble next. Well, Piero, I have done Barney Rubble, and boy, was Betty jealous. Got another letter from Anne in Milwaukee. Ah, gotta love the internet, and refers to last week's show when, where I did both a birthday tribute to Gordon Lightfoot and I sang the epic ballad, The Rectum of Edmund Fitzgerald, about the Mepham High School football team. Anne writes, Hi Dave, some trivia for your radio show. The Edmund Fitzgerald wreck can still be seen by scuba divers off the coast of Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, a northern suburb of Milwaukee. Well, and uh, what that has to do with teenage football players sodomizing each other with pine cones, I don't know. But thanks for the tip. And if I'm ever in Wisconsin, I'll know where not to drink the water. Folks, I want to hear from you. Dave's gone by at AOL.com or drop me a line the old-fashioned way. Dave's gone by, Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062. That is the address for letters, CDs, checks, and all the trimmings. And if you're interested in advertising on this program, maybe sponsoring one of the segments, we even have a phone number to call, 516-295-1511, area code 516-295-1511. And be sure to check our website, hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. I've got a book on sale there, and it makes a great gift for Christmas 
or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or whatever the yellow people celebrate. Also, you can purchase cassettes of classic Dave's Gong Buys going back to last fall. Lots of information on the website about the show, pictures. Don't miss the picture of turkey and gravy soda. It'll be up there for another day or two. Give it a look. Hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. If you forget the URL, just Google search Dave's Gone By and you should get it pretty quick. One thing I also wanted to mention, I went on a little bit of a rave at the end of last week's show about Cartoon Network and the fact that they had moved Aqua Teen Hunger Force that I had gotten addicted to watching at midnight on Sunday nights. Well, turns out you know, I, I got all upset for nothing. They actually moved it a little earlier. It's now on at 11, so... I'm happy. Thank you, Cartoon Network. I'm sorry about it, Joe, because that's when Joe Salzone's show is on, one of his shows on this uh, radio station. But if I had to choose between Meet Wad and Joe, well, I guess I give my... <laughs> Joe, Joe says the same thing. I'll leave it at that. Hey, the ideal way to end the program about Thanksgiving is to thank people. So here goes. Thank you, Engineer Joe Salzone. Nice job, by the way, interviewing Michael Jackson at the top of the show. He's a he's a strange character, and I think he Thanks. behaved very professionally, considering you know he had his hand in your lap the whole time. Oh, don't deny it. I saw everything, and don't tell me he was just looking for his nose. But folks, where if, were you to help me? <laughs> well, uh, anyway, um, but folks, if you're looking for conservative political chat with a sense of humor and an open-minded viewpoint, don't look here, but you can also listen to Your World with Joe Salzone, Sunday nights at 6, plus he's got a more off-the-cuff program, Sunday nights at 11, same time as Meet Wog and the Gang, and you can also hear him Monday nights at 6, just before my show, like you did tonight. And Mondays at 11. And Mondays at 11. Any other times? Feel free. Just go to JoeSalzone.com. Good idea. JoeSalzone.com. Um, thank you also to Bonnie D. Graham, hostess of Long Island's Dating, a show for singles, Friday nights at 6. Thank you to the Tondora Grill on Sunrise Highway in Rockville Center. Check their India delicious menu at TondoraGrill.com. And finally, thank you to my wife, Joyce, who does not always agree with what I do, but is always my number one fan. But all of you listening are my number two, three, four, five, and six thousand fans, maybe more, maybe less. But I'm grateful to all of you for giving me your ear. And thank you to, to, for listening and for keeping in touch. For letting me fill your ears with stuffing every Monday night, 6.30 to 8 p.m. <laughs> Joe is giving me a look of absolute abject horror. I'll do this all again next week, December 1st, with the 54th edition of Dave's Gone By. Oh, actually, I could stretch this a little bit. I've got three minutes, and I, uh... Wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to tell that vomit joke again. I, I, have, I have, like, a minute. I'm going to do it, because I broke up in the middle of it. I'm going to find it in the news gone by, and I'm going to do it right, I promise. Because it was, it, was, it was good. It was about the uh, turkey soda. It says, uh... What do Michael Jackson and Kmart have in common, Dave? I don't know. What do Michael Jackson and Kmart have in col- common, Joe? They both have boys' pants half off. Oh, thank you. I wish I had my comedy keys. Um, oh, and, and speaking of the turkey and gravy soda, you know, the most unusual thing about it is free of charge, you also get vomit soda. It's really just the turkey and gravy soda 30 seconds after you've had it. Thank you. There go the comedy keys of Joe Salzone. And the comedy stylings of Dave Lefkowitz, which you get every week, Monday night, 6.30 to 8 p.m. I'll do it again. Tune in December 1st. Until then, don't miss your days going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz. Good night. Hurrah for the fun. Rubba rubba. And gone high.